morning. I'm Kim McClary, President and CEO of the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. Thank you all for joining us and thank you all for your ongoing support of our live streams. We have a terrific plan of live streams through the summer and the fall and we're making plans for a ter terrific lineup in 2021. So if you have ideas for speakers or topics, please be sure to let us know as we want you to be included in all of our planning with these live streams. Please go to our website at lawac.org to see how you can continue to support us by becoming members, by registering for our events, and by making donations. We can't do this without your support. It's now my pleasure to introduce you to today's program, Opportunities for Foreign Policy, Assad's New Syria, with Dr. Zaki Lababidi, President of the Syrian American Council, Charles Lister, Senior Fellow, Director of Syria and Countering Terrorism at the Middle East Institute, Thomas McClure, founding member and researcher of the Rojava Information Center, and our moderator, Miriam Zar, who is founder of Women Found, and also we're proud to say a member of the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. For those of you who are joining us online, we will be taking questions in about 20 minutes. There's a control panel on the right-hand side of your screen where you can type in your questions. Jessica Deganzik, our Vice President of Events, will be managing your questions during the Q&A portion of today's program, and she'll do her very best to get to as many of your questions as possible. Mary Ann, it's time for me to turn this over to you. We're looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Kim, and uh, thank you to LA World Affairs Council and Town Hall for always uh, offering us members and, and the community uh, so many great programming on so many different topics that impact uh, people around the globe and us here at home as the coronavirus has taught us anything that happens anywhere eventually impacts us here. So I'm happy to be here with all of you. Um, I, we have a wonderful panel of guests who are going to talk about Syria from a, a variety of different angles. It's kind of exciting to have a panel where everybody is focused on one issue, which is Syria in the aftermath of conflict. Um, but they all come to it from uh, quite different angles. So it'll be exciting to have this conversation. Um, I think you see them all. So I will introduce our panelists and then uh, we'll ask a few questions and we'll open it up to the audience questions. Um, so as Kim said, I'm Mariam Zar. I'm a member of LAWAC. I was also um, a correspondent. I'm Iranian. Um, I was a correspondent in the Middle East for years and have been watching the Syria war, uh, sadly, for nearly a decade. Um, our guests are today Charles Lister. He is a senior fellow and director of the Syria and Countering Terrorism and Extremism programs at the Middle East Institute. His work focuses primarily on the conflict in Syria and on issues of terrorism. He also serves on the Syria Study Group, which is um, which is a, a, a group that was launched by the Institute of Peace, where he makes recommendations for U.S. military and diplomatic strategy. So he comes to us from sort of a political strategist point of view. Thomas McClure, as uh, Kim said, is actually in Northeast Syria right now. He's with the Rojava Information Center. He was a founding member and they're a leading independent news source on the ground. From his vantage point, he sees the impact of conflict unfolding in people's lives. And he sees the real life consequences of the geopolitics we all discuss from miles and miles away. Um, and finally, I've had the pleasure of meeting and talking to Dr. Zaki Lababidi, who is Syrian American. He's a cardiologist. He heads the board. He sits on the board of the Syrian American Medical Society. That's SAMS for any of you who want to find that on social media and follow their work. It's actually quite impressive. Um, he also uh, sits on the Syrian American Council, which is sort of an advocacy and policy group. Uh, for Syrian Americans here in, in, in the United States. And so they have some influence in Washington, D.C., and they're trying to see if they can help um, impact policies as we go forward. So since our focus is going to be on U.S. policy in Syria as we go forward, I'm going to start with Charles. Um, Charles, I want to ask you to, um, well, tell us a little bit about the work you do at the Middle East Institute, but also walk us quickly, if you can, through the last nine years and tell us why we find ourselves here at this moment right now. 
Well, thank you so much uh, for the very kind introduction. It's a pleasure to to be involved in this in this panel and this important discussion. Um, I think you you gave a, a good enough introduction. I wear sort of two hats um, at the Middle East Institute. Um, I'm a 24/7 Syria analyst. Um, I look at that primarily through the lens of the conflict itself. Uh, I spent a number of years earlier on in the crisis negotiating with over 100 armed groups in Syria, trying to pull them into the political process. So come with a fair amount of experience in terms of actually knowing the armed actors on the ground. And so I think that feeds into a lot of my work. Now, asking to summarize nine years of the Syrian crisis in a couple of minutes is a, is a very significant challenge. But I think from a policy perspective, I mean, US policy has wavered to and fro in a number of different directions over the last nine years. But if there was, I think, probably one word to summarize it, it's been containment. Um, there's never been a consistent desire in any administration to throw the US fully into the Syrian crisis one way or the other. Um, and so by and large, we have managed a campaign of pressure, at times military, at times financial, uh, on the regime itself. Um, we have been largely risk averse in terms of our assertiveness against Russia and Iran, the two primary backers of the Assad regime. Um, and we've generally favored uh, attempted diplomacy over real uh, assertiveness, or at least the kind of assertiveness that we might have traditionally associated the US with in the Middle East. Um, in terms of the Trump administration, um, Iran, uh, the Iran angle to the Syrian crisis has been front and center, uh, wrongly in my opinion, but many people might say uh, rightly these days. Um, our policy is no longer one of seeking the change of the regime. Our policy is now seeking a behavioral change in the regime. Um, we have, as has been very well um, said, and I'm sure as, as Thomas will say, um, the Trump administration has had a wavering commitment to our uh, allies in the Syrian Democratic Forces um, who helped us defeat the Islamic State over the last four or five years. But I think just if I was to make one broad point right at the outset, um, the war in Syria is not over, no matter what you might read in the public. Um, multiple insurgencies against the regime continue in different corners of the country. ISIS is not dead, it's alive and well, and in some areas of the country, possibly resurging. Um, Turkey continues to commit attacks against the Kurdish population and an insurgency continue, a Kurdish-led insurgency continues against Turkey inside Syria. Um, a massive crisis, the largest we've seen in nine years, continues in Idlib in the northwest of the country, where over three and a half million people live, 99% of whom are civilians. Um, there is a crippling economic crisis underway as we speak, uh, with hyperinflation. Um, uh, humanitarian people are saying there's a famine um, that may likely onset yeah. in Syria by this winter. COVID-19 is now newly spreading, um, particularly in regime-held areas of Syria. We have nationwide warlordism, corruption, a billion dollars worth of drugs was just seized in Italy, which investigations have just shown came from um, a regime-controlled factory in Latakia on the Mediterranean coast. I mean, I could make this list forever. Um, but to summarize, um, the US has basically treated symptoms of the crisis over the last nine years, but not the root causes and the drivers of the crisis itself. ISIS has been front and center, and most people on this call will know all about ISIS. But just to place them in context, 88% of the 225,000 civilian deaths over the last nine years were caused by the regime, 88%. ISIS was responsible for 2% of civilian deaths over the last nine years. Um, and so we've treated ISIS very well uh, in terms of defeating their territorial caliphate, but the core root drivers of the instability and the destruction and the corruption and what have you is the regime, and that has largely remained untouched. Thank you for that, Charles. That was a, a great way to frame the discussion we're going to have. Um, I, I do have to correct my own words and also note that, yes, uh, you know, the common narrative is that the rage of the war is subsiding, but I think as Thomas will tell us, there are still pockets that are that are uh, volatile at best. Um, Dr. Lababidi, I'm going to turn to you um, before I get to Thomas uh, to talk about the impact on the ground and and you know the fighting that's still going on and humanitarian aid that isn't reaching people. Um, I want you to tell me from your point of view and the Syrian American Council's point of view. Um, how has the, the, the U.S. policy over the last 10 years uh, unfolded 
from your point of view, I mean, you've been looking at policy, you've been looking at the Iranians and the Russians um, sort of managing that proxy war. Uh, you, you see your people, uh, roughly half of the population, half of the pre-war population of Syria, you know, looking for safety around the world and displaced. You're helping them on a, at a medical level. Tell us what the humanitarian situation looks like for you guys uh, while we're sort of looking at the policy narratives. Thank you very much, uh, Mariam. And uh, let me remind um, the audience uh, of how this uh, crisis started. Uh, the crisis started uh, because the Syrian people uh, went in the street seeking um, uh, freedom. Freedom from a dictatorship that uh, ruled Syria between uh, this president and his father, both dictators, bloody dictators, for 50 years now. The father took over in 1970. The first major massacre did not happen in 2011. It happened in 1982. February of 1982, from February 2nd to February 29, um, 40,000 people, according to um, uh, you know, foreign media, were massacred in the city of Hama by the regime. Um, and since then, Syrians have been under martial law for all the 50 years. We have, a, we have a constitution, but we are under martial law. In 2011, Syrians took to the street and they were faced with live bullets. Uh, protesters were gunned down in the street with, without any mercy. This is how things started in Syria. And, and this is why the, the Syrian uh, went to the street and still are seeking uh, freedom. Until 2014, uh, President Obama uh, in August of 2012 uh, said that Assad must go. When the President of the United States say that, we must have a plan, we must have a policy behind what we're saying. Um, of course, nothing was in place. Uh, Assad did not go. And, and um, furthermore, he used chemical weapons where in one night killed 1,400 women, children, and innocent civilians in one night. And that was the red line for the United States. That was, um, that was when Obama, uh, Mr. Obama, President Obama was asked, um, uh, what is your red line? Chemi the use of chemical weapons. What did we do about it? Nothing. And that gave the regime, of course, a free hand to massacre more people. 5,000 people, uh, killed by the regime in 2011 to 2012, 70,000 were killed in 2012 in the second year. And then of course the Russian came in in 2015, September. And since then the destruction of the infrastructure of Syria has been on a large scale beyond belief. Hospitals, schools, um, uh, uh, markets, uh, the killing of civilians uh, uh, was an, an just unimaginable scale since World War II. There hasn't been any destruction to cities and uh, civilian neighborhoods except in Syria by the Russians, the Iranians, and, and the regime. Um, we uh, come back to this year, 2020. Uh, as Charles said, don't believe that, that the war is over. Um, the attack on Idlib displaced one million people in the last three uh, months almost. And then, you know, we have a ceasefire, yet we still have the million people living in tents uh, outside their homes and their homes are empty. Why don't they get back, go back to their homes? Because the regime forces and Iranian forces are in their towns, but the homes are empty. Yet we have one million in tents and displaced and they cannot find food or um, uh, clean water in this time of COVID all over the world. So uh, we need to have a policy, uh, uh, finally, I mean, the US, uh, we have a responsibility for the world because for 10 years, you have children living in camps are not getting education. These people are not going to be engineers and doctors. What are they going to be? Somebody's gonna take advantage of them, give them AK-47 and pay them $50 a month and, and do whatever. Uh, we need, to be responsible for these refugees and we need to take care of them and send them to their homes. There are thousands, hundreds of thousands of homes empty in Syria. The people cannot return just because the regime forces are there. 
and they're afraid of being arrested and tortured to death like happened in Assad prisons for the last 50 years, not only the last 10 years. What is the policy? Thank you for that. Thank you. So, thank you for framing that. I, I want to note that I actually traveled to a refugee camp um, and, and so I've seen up close and personal what, it, what happens to people and families when they're displaced. Uh, Thomas, you're on the ground. You live among people who are struggling to stay on their soil. Um, I want you to please tell us a little bit about the Rojava Information Center. What is unique about that area? Um, and then also let us know what you see unfolding among the population. And I know that there is uh, you are struggling with a couple of issues, water aid being one of them or two of them, also the economy, the threat of COVID. Uh, you're on the ground. Let us know what it looks like. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm here um, in Kamishlo, Kamishli, um, in what's called Rojava, the autonomous regions of uh, North and East Syria. And um, I think uh, both Charles and Dr. Zaki have done a very good job of explaining how the Assad regime um, drove uh, this colossal crisis which has unfolded in Syria. What I think is often lost in these discussions is that there is a, a kind of received narrative that there was the regime, there was the democratic opposition which rose up and that unfortunately that opposition was very quickly bombed, imprisoned by the Assad regime and also subsumed uh, by uh, radical actors, of course ISIS, also Jabhat al-Nusra, al-Qaeda in Syria and so on and that now we're left with Assad on the one side and the jihadis on the other. And what is often forgotten is that there are there is a huge uh, region, one third of Syria, which uh, is continuing uh, this tradition of a democratic opposition, a search for secularism, for human rights, for freedom of speech. And that's what's happening here uh, in North and East Syria, where, as people will probably know, principally the Kurds, but also the local Arab and Christian populations have achieved autonomy and uh, principally through their fight against the Islamic State, which was so uh, world famous and have been able to attempt to set up uh, this system here in the Northeast based on women's leadership, based on uh, direct democracy, um, and which, as I said, in many ways is the real inheritor of this spirit of the Syrian revolution from the outset. Um, of course, there are a lot of actors who are not uh, at all happy about these efforts and who are trying to wipe it out. So. Yeah, I'm uh, here now, like uh, just a couple of kilometers from the border, as people will know, um, it has launched successive invasions um, against this region, carried out policies of forcible demographic change against the Kurds and the Yazidis in particular, also the Christians, um, uh, launching airstrikes and also deploying uh, radical militias to rape, uh, to kill, uh, to terrorize the local population, uh, most notably uh, in the world press, the killing of British politician Hevrin Karloff last year, but of course that's just the tip of the iceberg. Turkey, of course, also uh, manipulates the water flow, as you said, um, both by cutting off the water uh, from the pumping station, which it occupied last year, and by reducing the flow from the river, which means big water shortages, big electricity shortages. Uh, this region, like all of Syria, is part of a major economic crisis, which I'm sure we will talk about later, meaning it's hard for people to buy food. Then, of course, we have the regime uh, to the south, who are also uh, trying their hardest to seize back control of this region as they've been seizing back control of the rest of Syria. Um, so yeah, the regime is um, cutting off aid, unfortunately aided in that by the United Nations under Russian pressure, meaning that uh, the only UN aid crossing into this region was also cut off. And uh, then this region, of course, facing um, in general an embargo and, and enforced by Turkey, by Iraq um, and by the Syrian regime due to its lack of uh, international recognition, which means that, um, yes, there are extreme pressures facing this region from all sides. And uh, these questions, of course, are pressing because of uh, yeah, the humanitarian situation here and because of these people's rights as Syrians to self-determination to this democratic project. Uh, but also, of course, it should be very concerning to the United States, which has its best partner in Syria as the Syrian Democratic Forces with whom they defeated ISIS. Um, in which, uh, you know, if it's serious about supporting a positive future for the Syrian people, it has to look here in northeast Syria. But unfortunately, um, as we saw last year, the U.S.'s policy uh, towards uh, north and east Syria has been inconsistent, to say the least. Thank you for that. So just to make clear, you're a few miles from the Turkish border. And and yeah. and when the U.S. Uh, sort of uh, abruptly shifted policy and decided to pull out the roughly 1,000 troops, uh, you sort of saw the fallout of that 
you know, erratic shift in U.S. policy play out on the ground. I want to set this up so that everybody realizes what the U.S. does in Syria is incredibly important. Um, you know, we think it's easy to just be hands off in the Middle East because after all, we've been there for so long and what good have we done? But the reality is that every move we make impacts you guys. So at the moment, the fact that they don't have water in the area, again, uh, you know, has something to do with the U.S. pullout and, and our refusal at the moment to at least tell the Turks to give you water. Uh, the fact that humanitarian aid doesn't come through is because the assumption is that Damascus is back in control and so aid has to go through Damascus versus over the border straight to you. So just want to make note that U.S. policy is huge. Um, so Charles, set up for us what we're looking at now in Syria. We have a convergence of a few different crises. We've got an Assad who is second generation, has brutalized his people to keep power. Um, what's different this time and is he either destabilized or can we make him somewhat unstable? And is that even in our interest? You're muted. Apologies. Uh, I think your question made a number of really important points by them by itself. Um, I think uh, I think a lot of the points that Thomas made are, are very reflective of the fact that no single actor anywhere in Syria acts in a vacuum. Um, Turkey and uh, certain Kurdish uh, parties have long been uh, in conflict, and the fact that there has continued to be that conflict in northeastern Syria is reflective of a 40-year history in that immediate environment. Likewise, the fact that an opposition rose up in 2011 didn't happen in a vacuum, as, as Dr. Zaki made clear. Um, there was a long history of, of opposition, um, both peaceful and, and for a very brief period. Uh, violent in the early 1980s. Um, and the regime's history of dealing with that opposition has been uh, consistently brutal ever since the early 70s. So none of these things happen in a vacuum. None of them are as simple as they sound. They're all overlapping. There are multiple conflicts going on inside Syria and across its borders. Um, and, none of, and there's really no light at the end of the tunnel, frankly, for any of those conflicts. Uh, and certainly not for any of the, the root drivers um, that give way to them. Um, and that's really the most depressing thing, looking at Syria nearly a decade on since the peaceful uprising of 2011. Um, I think when you're looking at Assad himself, um, you know, there's, there's a long-standing motto within the regime, which was, it's Assad or we burn the country. And I think sadly, nine or 10 years on, we have Assad and they've burnt the country. Um, and Assad hasn't, in my opinion, he hasn't won, he has survived. Um, and the methods that he has put into place to survive have, as Dr. Zaki said, destroyed half the country. Uh, the infrastructure is, is, is simply not there, as we're seeing in terms of the response to COVID and other humanitarian issues. Um, and the economy is now spiraling out of control. Um, and the, the economic crisis we're seeing right now is, lar is largely self-inflicted. It is a result of regime mismanagement, corruption, um, and brutality over the last decade. Um, sanctions from the US, from the European Union, may potentially exacerbate some of the effects of the economic crisis, but they're absolutely not the cause. Um, and I think the economic crisis really stands here at the center of what we might see over the next year or two. I mean, I'm hearing from loyalists and people who have chosen for their own protection to stay within regime territories over the last nine years, that there has never been such an intense level of frustration and disenchantment with the current regime. Um, and I think that's potentially very significant. We're not going to see a nationwide uprising from within loyalist areas, um, but we are seeing restlessness uh, of the like that we've never seen, public expressions of opposition to the regime from its own loyalist communities. Um, and there are rumors swirling around that certain people who've kept a foot within the regime over the last 10 years may potentially stand for the presidential election in six or seven months time. They're certainly not going to win, but the fact that they will stand as, as internally credible candidates and will almost certainly be cheated of any chance of running in a fair way may also exacerbate those senses of disenchantment. So I think really the sort of in a way the chickens may come home to roost. The regime has done everything in its power to survive, but in so doing, it may have caused its own internal crisis that will slowly erode its own credibility within its base. I mean, we are, it, it's very difficult to predict, um, but certainly what we're seeing right now is new. It has not happened over the last nine years and it should be taken note of. So it's interesting that you say that, um, that even his loyalists are shaking in their support. 
um, and that there are rumblings. And Dr. Zaki, you can tell us how difficult it is to have rumblings anywhere in Syria, but that there are rumblings that people are displeased or you know, less than pleased with, um, with Assad. It's interesting that you say that no revolution will come from that group, but maybe there will be an appetite for some sort of moderation or maybe a coalition government that, that's, you know, maybe more representative, um, you know, reforms, maybe an election. Is that, Charles, I'm going to turn to you, Dr. Zaki, in a second, but Charles, is that sort of what you envision when you think about change in Syria? I mean, in an ideal world, perhaps, but I don't see, given his uh, his history, Bashar is not going to give way to any kind of significant reforms. I mean, frankly, in March 2011, Syrian men, women and children were walking on the streets, holding roses, uh, mm. calling for reform, not regime change. And they were met with machine gun bullets and tear gas um, and then later tank fire, artillery, helicopters, et cetera, et cetera. So when faced with disenchantment within his own base, Bashar is not going to step down. Um, and almost certainly uh, he will start cracking down on any of those um, uh, signs of, of, of opposition, which he already has in the southeast of the country, in the Druze majority area, um, which did stand up in protest for nearly two weeks recently. Um, and that was, that was uh, forcibly shut down. So I think what's much more likely um, and this is where U.S. policy comes in, um, that we have thrown in some very significant sanctions in the last month or so, known as the Caesar sanctions, um, which will serve probably to exacerbate some of the effects of the economic crisis. But the target of that sanctions policy-wise isn't necessarily to change the regime's own internal decision-making. It's to force particularly Russia into a position of having to accept that it's um, the crisis that Russia now finds itself having to manage may be unsustainable and that the only way out of that in terms of Western sanctions easing, potentially reconstruction money in the years in the future, will be to see some extent of political change in Damascus. And I think that even if it's a slim likelihood, that's what we're more likely to see than the regime basically giving up on, its, on itself, which, which we have really no reason to believe will happen. Thank you for that. Dr. Zaki, um, you're, you're, you're working in Washington to affect U.S. policy, and you, um, you, know, you were part of the group that advised for the Caesar sanctions. Um, I, I want you to talk a little bit about sort of Assad, the way that he rules, the fact that any opposition is quelled pretty quickly, um, and what effect do you think those sanctions are going to have? I mean, as far as I understand, they're pretty personal. They're against Assad, they're against his wife, um, his, his closest supporters. Um, how does that help Syria and uh, sanctioning Assad, potentially being able to seize his money? Where would you like to see that money spent? Right. So the, the, the Caesar uh, Act really is, is uh, very severe uh, economic sanctions, um, probably the most severe uh, that's applied to any country. Uh, in of itself is not going to um, topple the regime. There's, there's no way. But it is a tool to pressure the regime. And it is um, um, probably a start giving effect uh, even before uh, the uh, uh, list of names when was announced. I mean, the uh, fractured um, be between uh, Assad and, uh, and his cousin Makhlouf who controlled the economy of Syria for years. This, this was a, a shocking uh, development to all Syrians. Uh, the regime survived by, by, by these people, few people around uh, the Assad family. Um, so um, Makhlouf was running the economy in the country. He, he is the money man. And if he, did, you know, having a problem with Assad, that means Assad having difficulty getting his hands on cash. That's a problem. Uh, the Syrian pound, the Syrian pound, uh, after all what uh, Russia and Assad regime did in Dara and Ghouta and all of that, was uh, $1 to 500 pound. In six months between December and now, even just the anticipation since the uh, Caesar Act was uh, uh, approved in Congress and signed by the president before it was applied even, the Syrian pound now, $1 to 3,000 Syrian pound. Um, same thing in, in Lebanon. Most of the businessmen that supported the regime, their money are in Lebanon. And Lebanon um, uh, banking system is crumbling. Uh, 
um, the um, um, you know the dollar to Lebanese pound was 1500 in December and it's 11,000 now, one dollar to 11,000. So you can see the fract economic fracture. You can see the effect of Caesar before even the, the list announced. Uh, for Bashar Assad as a dictator and his wife, who has been presented so far as a progressive woman from, you know, she speaks perfect English, she has a British citizenship uh, and all of that. The, peop the people of the world saw uh, Asma Assad for her, her reality. She stood by the uh, dictator killing his own people for 10 years. And now she is named um, in these sanctions. That's a huge, uh, uh, even symbolic issue for all Syrians and people in the world is, is the, the president, a dictator, his wife, his family, his, his brother, sister, their own name. But we need to, you know, to really push to for more uh, application of the Caesar law on, um, uh, unfortunately, surrounding countries that's helping Assad even now as we speak, even with, um, you know, the sanction in place. We also um, should, um, uh, you know, apply that to any entity inside Syria and in northeast Syria that is working with the regime and supplying him with oil and other. Uh, things that uh, we could we could stop and help the regime tumble. There is there is indication that this regime is being fractured. Um, uh, there is a, a indication that this regime is being pressured by Iran and Russia big time. Uh, in the last ten days, there have been a series of assassination of very high-ranking officers in the Syrian regimes. Uh, some of them because they are um, loyalists to Iran and and probably you know assassinated by Russia. There is an, obviously a control issue between Russia and Iran now. There is, in my opinion, an opportunity uh, for uh, the U.S. foreign policy to take advantage of that in the next few months and really act on applying the uh, U.N. Um, uh, Security Council Resolution 2254 by installing a, a transitional government. And this government will be able, hopefully, to rebuild the country and, and apply the transitional um, um, uh, accountability, transitional justice, accountability, and move the country to the next step. Uh, this regime will not change. There is no way there is behavioral change. We've been trying for 50 years. Uh, in the last 20 years, a lot of Syrians tried peacefully to change the regime policies. It did not work. In the early 2000s, there was multiple uh, attempts on that, even from the Syrian American community in 2005, uh, trying to reform the regime. This regime is, is, cannot be reformed. It has to be stopped. And for the world peace, it has to be stopped. And Charles knows that this regime is behind a lot of terrorist attacks conducted in Iraq on our own troops. Uh, at least 600 American troops died at the hand of terrorists that were sent to Iraq by the Assad regime. Um, uh, Baghdadi was in, in, in his prison. Jolani when in his prison. He was released from Assad prisons after 2011. So this man worked with terrorists all the time and the latest, and now they're working with, with you know, um, drugs. The latest uh, seizure of this uh, huge amount of drugs on the uh, Italian coast coming from regime areas. Uh, his brother, Maher Assad, worked with, with this. So we need, we need to take the opportunity to start the, a new beginning in Syria, the U.S. really could take a, a big role in this, um, uh, installing transitional government, uh, start releasing of um, um, uh, political prisoners. Um, the Syrians themselves, there's a Syrian International Business Association, 500 Syrian businessmen are ready to invest in their country. They just want an environment of peace um, and stability to, be, to invest. We are not looking for a handout from the world. We can, Syrians around the world are successful in many places and we're able to rebuild our countries. So we, we need stability, we need this regime to go. It is time for Assad to go. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mariam, Zaki. I'd like there, to yeah, come in there. Yeah, yeah.
I'm going to give it to you. I just want to say, I know there are a lot of questions, but I want to hand it over to Thomas because I want you to talk about a solution that might be Syrian and just give us your impression. Sure, yeah. So, yeah, I just wanted to put a bit in context about, you know, what these sanctions look like um, on the ground here in Syria. Um, so, I mean, as they've said, the Syrian pound this time last year was about 500 Syrian pounds to the dollar. Now it's gone up to 3,000. So, of course, what does that mean? You know, Syrians were living on the equivalent of maybe $90 a month here. That's gone down to about $20 a month in the space of a, a fortnight uh, connected to the Lebanese crisis, also connected to those sanctions. So this means, yeah, I know, I mean, even for us, um, it's hard to buy stuff like vegetables now for our neighbours, uh, Kurdish and Arabic neighbours, it's uh, even harder. So for sure, these uh, sanctions are making people suffer a lot. Um, situation is even worse for civilians in regime-held areas and uh, in the northwest, where people are even struggling to uh, afford bread. So it's a question as to whether all this suffering for the Syrian people is worth it if uh, as uh, both of the, the other speakers have said, this is unlikely to actually affect the uh, Assad regime. But uh, this is the decision of the American uh, government. This is how they've chosen to apply pressure. So then yeah, we need to think about uh, the situation in the Northeast, um, which uh, Dr. Zaki um, briefly raised. So, you know, well, why is it that here in the Northeast, the administration can provide bread can provide a uh, basic care and shelter to millions of people despite being cut off from the world of course it's because of the oil um, which they have there and uh, as uh, dr zaki said a lot of that oil which is produced here is now being sold into regime areas and this i think really illustrates the lack of clarity on american policy on syria that uh, you know um the administration here has been asking the us for years and years and years Give us a waiver, let us trade our oil with the outside world. We've got nothing to do with Assad. We're against Assad. We're building a democratic project and we want to engage with the world through Iraq. We want to trade, we want to build something self sufficient here. Um, the US says no. And so, um, if the administration here doesn't want to let its people starve, it then has to sell this oil to a regime held areas in the US. Um, you know, sometimes even bombs uh, the trucks which are doing this. And of course, all the US has to do is to support um, uh, the region, the, the autonomous regions here to engage with the outside world, which is what they want. Um, and this would, of course, have the, of course, have an impact on the regime, would stop them from being able to access this oil, which is um, important, I think. Um, and it would also yeah. allow uh, the Northeast here to continue caring for its people, providing for its people, to reduce the interconnectedness of these two uh, economies. Um, of course, uh, this would uh, demand um, opening up a border crossing with Iraq, breaking this embargo, which is being forced on this autonomous region, it would mean the UN reversing its decision to cut uh, the sole aid crossing here, but opening it up again. And uh, all of this, you know, is somehow covered by what Donald Trump last year said when he said we're staying in Syria to protect the oil. And I think as we go into the upcoming US election, you know, this is the, the hope for this region, that if we want to preserve this region of Syria outside the regime and to strengthen it, to sever um, the relation of necessity it has with the dominant force in Syria, then this is the way to go. The US government has said they want this region, Northeast Syria, to be exempt. That's the practical path forward to make that happen, to strike a blow to the Assad regime and to make life easier for people there. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, so that sets up for all of our listeners the, uh, the opening remark that Charles made. There are various different uh, battles going on within the larger conflict that we see in Syria, and none of it is easy. Certainly one of the most complex issues we're looking at right now, uh, although the Middle East is replete with them. Jessica, I'm going to hand it over to you. I'm sure we have plenty of questions. Uh, we, we probably can have this conversation for a while because we still haven't talked about Iran, it being defanged, Russia, uh, but let's hand it over to questions. I'm sure these things will come up. Thank you so much. We have a lot of questions, so I apologize. I know we won't be able to get to all of them. Um, but Thomas, first question to you. Is it true ISIS members are returning to areas under Turkish control, such as Afrin, Tal Abyad, and Ras Al Ain? Yes, yeah, of course it's true. Um, everyone who covers Syria knows this. So as the Rajab Information Center, we've just submitted a report to the United Nations detailing the names, biographies, place of origin of around 40 former ISIS members in the, the new zone of Turkish occupation. Um, we also documented around 40 ISIS members in Afrin, another region which Turkey occupied. And 
other local um, news reporters have documented hundreds of such cases. So this is not just a case of one or two bad actors. There are a lot um, of former ISIS members. Just two weeks ago, the ISIS's former top guy in Raqqa, who oversaw the capital of the caliphate, was killed by a US drone strike. He was living in Turkish areas under Turkish protection with a Turkish ID card. Um, and so, you know, uh, what's happening here? You know, ISIS is very different and to these Turkish factions are very different. ISIS was this top-down um, uh, proto-state to these Turkish factions are uh, more, we can say, primarily concerned with criminality, with uh, petty acts of violence against the local population, extortion, kidnapping, uh, violence against women. Um, what ISIS finds here is a safe haven where they can regroup. There have been meetings of the former ISIS members in these zones where Turkey have installed their um, uh, jihadist prox proxy militias. Um, and so what we've seen as a result of this, you know, of course, is uh, partly driven by the former ISIS members, also by the thousands and thousands of um, uh, jihadist forces which Turkey has installed in these regions is a switch from uh, where these regions were, as I said, you know, the only parts of Syria where there remains secularism, democracy, rule of law, uh, high human rights standards, to the opposite, total chaos, uh, being overseen by a uh, NATO member, uh, Turkey. And so I think if we're looking uh, for a, a future for Syria, of course, we have to deal with the Assad regime. We also have to deal with Turkey, um, which is yet, yeah, as uh, you have said, uh, sponsoring the presence of former ISIS members. Um, has quite a cosy working relationship with the um, former Al, the former Al Nusra Front, the Al Qaeda linked faction which is in control of Idlib, and uh, restoring these uh, Kurdish uh, regions, undoing the forcible demographic change which has been carried out there should be a top priority. And again, this is something which is uh, achievable for the US if it has the willpower. Thank you so much. Um, to Dr. Zaki. Uh, sorry, Lababidi. Um, how much of a factor, direct or indirect, uh, was drought triggered by climate change a trigger for the Syrian civil war? Are we ignoring security concerns relating to climate change at our peril? Um, uh, I really don't think so. Um, um, I don't think climate change is the um, a direct um, uh, factor. Um, Syrians, whoever lived in Syria, know that Syrians have been living in fear for 50 years. You could be arrested, disappeared, killed for no reason whatsoever. In 1982, when the Hama massacre was going on, I was in, in, in homes with my father in my own car. And just because a regime ambulance felt that I'm slowing him down, when he, when he passed me, he got his AK-47 from the, um, uh, you know, from the ambulance window, sprayed my car with about 20 bullets. And by miracle, my father and I were not killed. And his ambulance went on to go to the hospital like nothing happened. While I stopped to see what happened to my car that start, you know, uh, uh, shaking all over and all three tires out of four are down and and all the bullets in the car i could not believe that we both survived and that's just an incident on a road and that's that's almost 40 years ago we're not talking about 10 years ago this is how syrian live that incident is, is what made me you know determined the minute i'm done with my medical school leave i'm leaving the country there is no way you cannot resist this regime you cannot work against them you cannot reform them. you either die or or find uh, a, a life uh, somewhere else so um the the result the uh, i'm sorry the the reason why why syrian took to the streets is the brutality of the regime for 40 years and between 2000 in 2010, multiple reform attempts were made, and Charles uh, said it correctly. When people went into the street in the beginning, they were asking for reform. They were not asking for regime change. And then, of course, um, the um, uh, dictator Assad came and gave his famous speech, which he, um, uh, which he said about his own people, they are germs. And they need to be killed with antibiotics. Like we killed germs and antibiotics, they need to be killed. That's what he said in his in response to the peaceful demonstration. And then and everything, you know, of course, followed. Uh, so you really have to live in Syria and know how Syrians lived 
uh, under that regime to, to know why this happened in 2010. Thank you so much. Um, Charles, for you, we hear news of SDF continued oil trade with the Assad regime despite the Caesar bill. What is the US policy to enforce the bill on our allies, the SDF? I think that's a very good question. I don't think anyone really has the answer. I mean, for now, the US, as Thomas said, has no project, has had no problem with the SDF selling oil to the regime. Uh, through middlemen, through known and identified middlemen, um, and one assumes that will continue. Uh, questions have been asked of the of the US government as to whether or not um, money will come or some kind of bailout will come for the SDF um, and its political council, the SDC, in terms of its ability to continue to pay salaries. Um, and uh, there's not really been much of an answer uh, from that either. So I think, you know, this is another reflection of a lack of clarity from um, from the current administration, um, which I think is being pulled in a in a, in a whole number of different directions. Um, so I think that the, the trade will continue as as it has done before, because frankly that money is is necessary um, internally within the SDF, especially given um, the wider economic crisis. And just speaking of the economic crisis, if I can sort of go off on a on a related tangent, you know, just to to mention, I think um, comments by both. Um, other colleagues here on the call have seemed to suggest that the sanctions are behind um, particularly the inflation that we've seen. Um, that just isn't true. Um, I understand from uh, the Syrian American community there is a desire uh, to see the Caesar uh, Act have an immediate effect. So sanctions don't have that immediate of an effect, especially on a, on a national economy. Um, they might have an effect on personal transfers and remittances and things like that, and we have seen that effect. Uh, fairly quickly. Um, but every single professional economic uh, analysis of the Syrian economic crisis has tailed it back um, primarily to the Lebanese financial crisis um, because the, uh, the, the, the economy in, in Damascus is existentially reliant on access to the US dollar. And as soon as Lebanon went into crisis, access to the US dollar plummeted. And that has spiraled the Syrian uh, pound um, into the inflation that we've seen. And then secondarily, um, we've seen uh, complete mismanagement by the regime, uh, corruption and funneling away of resources um, within the regime cronies. Um, and then thirdly, perhaps the restrictions on the local economy imposed by COVID. So I think that's an important point worth bearing in mind. The effect on a national economy does not happen that quickly from sanctions that we've only seen introduced a few weeks ago. Um, undoubtedly, as I said earlier, they will likely exacerbate certain um, effects of the broader economic crisis, but we certainly haven't seen that yet. Um, lots of other things I want to say, but uh, I'll give some more time for, for some more questions. I just want to so uh, take a quick comment. I'm sorry. Um, I did not mean that Caesar, you know, um, uh, act um, was behind the inflation. Obviously, as Charles stated, inflation happened because uh, misguided economic policies and spending the hundreds of millions of dollars on bombing his own population and spending it on the military and not uh, spending it on, on, on the country infrastructure that he actually destroyed. Um, the economic crisis happened because of 10 years of mismanagement and misguided policies in the economy of Syria. Um, I, if it came that I, uh, I said that the Caesar Act did the inflation, I, I did not mean it that way. Thank you so much. Uh, Thomas, I'm going to direct this one to you. Um, what is the current status of the Israeli military effort in Syria against Hezbollah and other Iranian-backed groups? Um, I think Charles probably uh, followed that subject uh, more than me and is uh, probably better placed to answer that. I think it's more his field. All right, turn it over to Charles. Okay, sure. I'm happy to take it. Thanks, Thomas. Um, I think, uh, I mean, the Israelis over the last few weeks have, um, I think it's calmed down just in, just very recently, but a few weeks ago, they'd definitely uh, intensified their airstrikes against Iranian targets um, in Syria. Uh, whether that's indicative of different decision making um, in, in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, or whether it's indicative of changes on the ground inside Syria is very hard to tell. Um, I think undoubtedly the Iranians do continue to uh, operate on a, on a on a high level 
um, both through its IRGC, the Revolutionary Guard Corps, um, as well as the uh, funneling, in, funneling in of strategic weapon systems into Syria, some of which are intended to stay in Syria, some of which are intended to cross the border into Lebanon to Hezbollah. Um, and I think all of those are are, are are actions that very clearly cross red lines that the Israelis have made very clear since the earlier years of the crisis, um, is that if they see uh, certain senior officials um, on Syrian soil, and particularly if they see those strategic weapon systems, that's uh, me short, long, and medium, uh, sh sorry, excuse me, short and medium and long-term, long-range uh, weapon sy uh, missile systems, um, air defense systems, which we saw arrive earlier last year, um, uh, and uh, a large influx um, of, uh, of militia forces um, into new areas uh, of operation, um, as well as the development of Iranian-controlled factories, um, particularly for manufacturing precision guidance missiles. All of those things have crossed various red lines, and I think that answers why we've seen strikes. But you know, if I'm to, to predict long term, the strikes will continue. There is nothing that's stopping the Israelis from continuing those those military actions. The Russians largely turn a blind eye, uh, and the Syrian regime is is almost entirely incapable of preventing those strikes from taking place. And if thank I could just, just um, quickly come in there. So yeah, like uh, thank you to Charles for that uh, overview. And then I would add, yeah, as you said, we haven't really got into the subject of the Iranians in uh, Syria yet. And um, sure, one cornerstone of uh, anti-Iranian policy in, in Syria is the airstrikes. The other cornerstone, of course, is the Syrian Democratic Forces, so the military wing of the political administration here in North and East Syria. And uh, this, of course, is uh, another vital region uh, for the US government to continue and strengthen its support for this region. I mean, that's really, I think, what, uh, as everyone knows, the reason the US is staying here is not to do with uh, continuing uh, to wipe up ISIS. It's uh, to do with maintaining this bulwark against Iran. There is now only one uh, region which is stopping Iran from achieving this corridor all the way through from Tehran uh, to the Mediterranean, and that is North and East Syria, uh, Rojava, as it's known, and the Syrian Democratic Forces. Um, as we discussed, um, there are those in the US who would like to install Turkey uh, in this region, but uh, practically speaking, the militias which Turkey is trying to use, as we've discussed, have uh, uh, very little respect for the rule of law, um, essentially petty criminal gangs prone to extreme acts of criminality against the local population. And so maintaining a, a stable support basis for the Syrian Democratic Forces, as we've said, opening up to them to stop selling oil uh, to the regime and start dealing with the outside world would be uh, the most kind of concrete step on the ground which could be taken to support these strikes. Thank you so much. Um, I'll ask this question if one of you wants to chime in. Um, what does Russia have to gain in Syria and will they help to rebuild Syria? Uh, I'm happy to, to shoot unless someone else wants to, but um, uh, I think um, I mean, Russia has long held a geopolitical position in opposition to American interventionism elsewhere, uh, particularly in the Middle East, but any really in theory anywhere in the world. Um, the Russians were vehemently opposed uh, to the US and European intervention in Libya. Um, I think once that had started to go sour, uh, the Russians felt uh, like their point had been proven. Uh, that once again, when America intervenes abroad, this is in Russian terms, um, only chaos ensues. Um, so I think when um, when the U.S. was playing a role um, in driving part of the conflict in Syria in the earlier years by backing um, the then mainstream opposition, um, the Russians quite clearly opposed that. Traditionally, historically, the Russians have been very close to the Syrian regime, both going all the way back to Soviet Union times, particularly through a military to military relationship. Um, but frankly, for me, I think a lot of it was geopolitics. Um, the Russians wanted to prove that they could outdo the Americans um, on the geopolitical stage. They could outsmart the US. They could outbluff the US, uh, force the US into making very public, big uh, geopolitical concessions, which largely they have done. Uh, we saw that back in 2016 and 17, when the U.S. effectively cut all ties to the opposition uh, through an arrangement that the Russians had put together um, on, on the international stage. 
Uh, that was, frankly, I think, quite humiliating for part of the US policy uh, administration that had put together that policy in the earlier years of the crisis, and it was a great victory for the Russians. And what we've seen ever since um, is really, to put it very bluntly, uh, Russia snubbing our nose um, in everything that it has done since, both brutally and also constructively. Um, it created its own political process that replaced Geneva. Um, it uh, put the put military to military negotiations on top of diplomatic ones, which was what we were trying to push. Um, and it has consistently put pressure, frankly, on the SDF. Um, uh, you know, uh, Thomas quite rightly blames um, a lack of clarity uh, and decision making on a U.S. side. Uh, and frankly, you know, pretty uh, brutal and inexcusable behavior from Turkey. Um, but the Russians have been in on the act too, uh, opening the way for Turkey to do what it's done, crossing the border. Um, and so, you know, again, that's just another reflection of just how complicated all of this is. Um, there are always multiple layers to these situations. If I may uh, so answer much. to that. Uh, this one is... Th in regard to Russia... Sure. I, I have a uh, question for you too, so we're almost out of time. I'm sorry. Fine. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this questioner asks uh, if you are actively coordinating with other Syrian diasporic groups in the UK, Germany, etc., as a way to represent the needs of the entire Syrian community that's been displaced by Bashar al-Assad. Um, that's what we're trying to do actually now is um, I think there's an opportunity if um, um, the world uh, and, and the US lead that effort to get um, uh, the Syrian all around the world together on uh, one plan, on one roadmap to get out of this mess in Syria, we were we will be able to do it. Um, again, as my you know Charles stated correctly, not only opposition areas now are are fed up with the regime, but his own people, his own backers. Uh, in Latakia and Tartus are not seeing an, an end to this conflict that, that in the way that they will be safe. Um, um, so Syrian can can do this. And we, we are trying to uh, get everybody um, uh, to come together with a, with a plan. We need uh, the leadership of the US, the application of US, a UN Security Council Resolution 2254 will be crucial. As we have seen over the years, the regime is not a partner in negotiations. We've been in Geneva so many times. The regime would not even show up. His, his people would not show up. The last time, the Russian has to put them and force them on a plane and bring them to Geneva. What happened in Geneva? Nothing. There is another round now, round of uh, negotiations supposedly in August. I guarantee you the regime will not let this negotiation come up with anything useful. So it's time to really see this clearly. We have to apply the 2254 resolution. We need a transitional uh, uh, political uh, uh, system uh, and lead the country to get out of this chaos. The chaos in Syria is not good for the world. Uh, the Russians finally, after 20 years, since the breakup of the Soviet Union almost 30 years ago, they have not been in the Middle East. And now they have the largest um, uh, naval uh, base in Tartus. Um, there'll be no peace probably in the area, not only in Syria, if we don't control what's happening in Syria and get it out of this mess. Thank you so much. Um, I know we are unfortunately out of time, so um, I appreciate all of you. And Marianne, I'm going to turn things back over to you. Thank you. I'm so glad. Thank you. Thank you for all those questions. I'm sure I can't imagine how many more there are. Um, before I let you guys go, I quickly, uh, just quickly, Charles, who are our partners? I mean, there's an election coming up. Um, there may or may not be a change in U.S. administration. We're going to have to reach out to our European allies and see who wants to come to the table and help pressure some sort of rebuilding in Syria. Just quickly, you've got about you know 45 seconds. Who are our allies in this? <laughs> um well, I mean, I think our allies are our traditional allies. I think we, we're, the Europeans will follow us on almost anything. Uh, uh, I say that wearing a, a, both a European and an American hat. Uh, the Europeans will follow the US. Um, the Europeans still remain in support of pressuring the regime. Zero reconstruction money until we see the kind of changes that we're demanding in Damascus. Um, and I think that will largely remain the case. The big question yeah. mark for me is the region. 
uh, whether or not some of the region um, will see uh, more short-term gains in re-engaging with the regime, in testing the Caesar Act, and whether or not they fear American sanctions in response to that. Uh, I think that in the next six to 12 months will be the big key. Uh, if we do see some of the region uh, muscling their way in to re-engage with the regime, then I think that poses a fundamental challenge to Western policy yeah. uh, and, and yeah. would represent an Assad victory. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, well, Europe is obviously greatly impacted by what goes on in Syria because the stream of the refugees uh, you know, impacts uh, Europe unmistakably. Thank you all so much, Dr. Zaki. Thomas, thank Charles, thank you for joining us thank today. You. Uh, thank, thank you, you, Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall for hosting us. I hope we can do this again, talk about Syria more often. Thank you all. Thank you, Mariam. Thank you. Thank you. Kim, over to you. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you for a very informative and sobering discussion. And thank you all for your time and sharing your expertise on these so, such critical issues. So God bless you that you're there with all your smarts and expertise. Thank you so much. Thank for you. Viewing, thank you so much. For, for our viewing audience, we have a Politics in the Time of Coronavirus on Thursday with politics professor Dan Schnurr. And next week, July 14th, we have a Bastille Day conversation about Emmanuel Macron and France and Europe's role in the world with William Drozdiak, who's a senior fellow at the Brookings Institute, and our favorite ambassador, John Emerson, who will be moderating that discussion. So please join us. Check out our website for all our upcoming programs. Please, everybody, stay safe, stay informed, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you all again so very much. Thank you.